as you've seen, if you've been a part the last two weeks, we've jumped back into the Old Testament, into the, the book of Second Chronicles. And it seems like an odd jump. You know, why not First Chronicles? Well, Second Chronicles is, is a crucial um, narrative account. And really, it used to be one book, as we talked about in week one. But Second Chronicles, from the time of Solomon until the moment of exile, is a great picture of the nation of Israel. The blessings that come with an obedient people and the pulling away of those blessings for those people, those kings that turn their back on God. And we see that played out time and time again, and we'll get into that some today. And so we followed up our, our sermon or our sermon series based on the our house, the body of Christ, and representing it, truly being who we say we are. And if we're going to change that narrative of our house, how people see Christians as a whole, see the church as a whole, there's things that we need to start doing and changing, and the way that we approach our interactions, our outreach, and even our daily lives does reflect on the church. And so that's what that series was on. And so a follow-up to that series is, okay, we're changing the narrative of how people see the church, trying to get rid of some of the stereotypes that are unfortunately based off of a great deal of reality of the way the church has carried itself throughout the years. And so now with this series, If My People, if we're going to represent Christ well, if we're going to represent our house well as the bride of Christ, the body of Christ, then we have to remember who we are. We are a part of God's church. We are God's church, the body of Christ. We are his people as believers. And if we are his people, then what are the responsibilities? What are the expectations? What should we be changing and doing? And how should we be living in light of that title and that reality? And so looking at Second Chronicles, we're really centering around the verse we went through last week. Um, verse, or chapter 7, verse 14. If my people who are called by my name humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear them from heaven and, forget, and will forgive their sins and heal them, you know, that or heal their land. That is, yes, a promise specifically to Israel. It was a reminder of the covenant that was entered originally in the laws of Moses and the, the promise of blessings when they as Israel would obey the Lord, when Israel would de devote themselves to true, pure worship. You know, what comes along with that? Because that is the responsibility of that covenant. Not just a promise from God that I'm going to bless you because you're Israel, but I will bless you if my people, you Israel, would live up to the covenant that we've created, this two-sided covenant that I will bless you, that you being my people will actually live up to that title, that name as children of God. It was both side, two sided on the type of relationship that was expected in that covenant. And so the, the history, the narrative accounts that we see in Second Chronicles gives us the, the context, gives us the audience, and it gives us an understanding of Israel's responsibility but also now for us, although that promise was to Israel, some of the same foundational truths are there that now that we are God's church, that there are responsibilities as God's people in the way that we approach the world, in the way that we approach God, the way that we respect and honor his word and his church. And if we're ever going to see revival, ever going to see any you know, change in the lives of those around us in the life of the church as a whole, it begins with us understanding that we are God's people. And as God's people, there are expectations that come a part of that covenant. We are now in a new covenant through Christ, covered in Christ's righteousness, a beautiful picture of the gospel and the grace of God, far from us deserving, a, deserving any of it. He has offered us Christ's righteousness through faith because of his grace, both being a gift from God, a, a beautiful understanding that we as believers have this, and therefore there are expectations on our end and the way that we respond to that gift and live now for him. And so looking at the history of Israel, we learn a lot about the history and the people, 
but we also see that there's correlations in the church today. And so for the chronicler, the one who wrote, many believe Ezra, some say maybe not, whoever it was wrote this to a post-exilic you know, Jewish community to a destroyed Jerusalem. You know, Nehemiah was able to rebuild the walls. Ezra and Nehemiah together were bringing people that had been scattered, taken away to Babylon, who had been in exile for 70 years, that now slowly trickling back in. Yes, living in tent city, but getting back to the promised land, getting back to, yes, a destroyed temple, but a temple that they will rebuild and did rebuild. And yes, was destroyed some hundred years, you know, several hundred years later after Christ came to this earth. And so this is the people that needed to hear a reminder that truly we are God's people. And because we as Israel, they as Israel, they had to understand and be reminded that God blesses an obedient people. They had seen what happens to a disobedient people. Jeremiah, the prophet, told them, if we continue down this road, if we do not repent, turn back to God, we will be taken away, our land destroyed. And that is what happens when the blessings are stripped away because of their disobedience, because they themselves continued to worship other gods, continued to defile the temple of God that Solomon had built, continued to show no regard at all for God as God's people. They would claim that title. We are a blessed nation because we are we are children of God. But they didn't look like the children of God. And the blessings that came as children of God, obedient children of God, were stripped away. So that's why Chronicles is really a comprehensive historical account of a period of time of Israel's history as a way to remind Israel of who God is and what their responsibilities as children of God are. And they saw as themselves now, after exile, returning to a destroyed city, destroyed temple, destroyed walls, that in this broken community, that there is still grace from their God. There is still grace to rebuild, grace to bring them back to the land that they themselves forfeited because of their disobedience. They had heard the stories of their ancestors. They had heard stories from grandparents, great-grandparents of what Jerusalem used to be. And now they needed a reminder of what it can be through the grace of God, through faithfulness to him. And so they needed to get back to a committed, focused, and devoted life as children of God. And in this narrative account so far, the first week we saw the rise of Solomon, King Solomon to his throne, the son of King David. He was on the throne for 40 years, a very long time as king. And we'll go through, if you read the accounts in First and Second Kings and First and Second Chronicles, you'll see some king's uh, time on the throne is measured by months and days instead of a period of 40 years. But as we saw with Solomon, his reign began with true worship and dedication. His heart was focused on God above all. He offered proper sacrifices. He showed the, the just perfect amount of dedication and service to God with a promise that, God, I'm going to build you a house. I'm going to build a temple for God, something his father wanted to do. But God told him, you will not be the one to build the temple for me, but your son will. Reminding David that you are a man of bloodshed and war, but your son will build the temple that you imagine, that you dream, that will make my presence here in the promised land a permanent, remi- a permanent reality, not just a tent that they carry around to cover the presence of God, the covenant, the Ark of the Covenant, the true tabernacle of God here on earth. And so last week, we saw that, yes, now that promise was completed. The temple was completed, just a magnificent temple. And we see that Israel is in a spiritually strong place. Remember the the sacrifices, just an absurd amount of sacrifices that Solomon brought to the temple for God. 120,000, and then we saw 20,000 of Israel. 
individual sacrifices placed before God because Solomon's saying, my God, Yahweh, deserves everything we have. He deserves more than we can give. And he's showing his heart. He's showing his commitment. And the nation of Israel saw that, and they too were spiritually in a strong place. And because of their devotion, their obedience, they were promised continued blessings with their continued devotion. That's particularly in chapter 7 that we highlighted a little while ago. But with that, God reminded them that in this covenant with Israel, it is a you know, reaffirming what was told through you know, the law of Moses back in Deuteronomy. But also the reminder to Solomon that these blessings are conditional on your obedience, on your commitment to me as my people. And yes, Israel started strong. But if you know anything about Israel's history, it didn't stay that way. You know, we already alluded to the exile that came about because of their disobedience, because that strong spiritual state did not last. In fact, we can see over Israel's history that the spiritual state of the nation fluctuated with the king's devotion to God. You always could see and find maybe a remnant, but the devotion of the nation, the the revitalization, the you know, getting back to God fluctuated with the king's focus of getting back to God or turning his back on God. The nation would often follow. And even with the great King Solomon, you know, the wisest man, the richest man, had everything you could ask for, way too many wives and concubines. That's maybe you start to question his wisdom on that. But even King Solomon later in life, because of the influence of these wives and all the influence of his riches, slowly turned his back on his devotion and worship to God. You know, you could say, well, it was still there, but he was slowly filtering in other gods, other forms of worship because of the influence of wives that were foreign wives that he would make an alliance with another nation. It's weird how that worked, right? Well, king, I want to make an alliance. And the king's like, well, let's do that. Here's my daughter in marriage. And that's a binding contract. You know, just a weird way of going about it. But that was part of how Solomon approached things back then. And with bringing in these foreign wives came foreign influence, foreign false gods that slowly began to turn his devotion away from God. And yes, you know, Solomon could have, justify try to excuse away but the truth was he was slowly you know putting that fire out in his devotion his focus his worship towards God and because of that God told Solomon towards the end of his life that I will God says I will tear the kingdom from from the house of David I will leave you one tribe I will leave you your tribe but he's telling him for the sake of David though I will not tear the kingdom away during your lifetime. So you won't see it, but you go to your grave knowing that because of your sins, it will be stripped away under your son's reign, under the reign of your son, son Rehoboam. And we see that become true. We see that this promise that God says, I will strip the kingdom from you. The house of David will be divided. We see that become a reality as does all of God's word. And it happened soon after Rehoboam became king after Solomon's death. And just kind of a recap, because I can't go through all of the history, but you got to have a little bit of context of what's going on here. It all started when the prophet Ahijah told Solomon that Jeroboam, a, who was a former official to King Solomon, would lead the people of Israel, would lead, in fact, ten tribes that God would strip away from his son, the 10 of the 12 tribes of Israel. And that news, of course, just angered Solomon that you can't divide this nation. We are one nation. You can't strip away my authority or my son's authority. He will be king over the entire nation. But no, the word has been spoken through the prophet by God that this is what is going to happen. And with that news, Solomon, in fact, tried to kill Jeroboam saying, well, it can't happen if I take his life. 
But Jeroboam was able to escape to Egypt, to escape until Solomon's death. But now Solomon has died. The news has spread into Egypt and throughout all of the known world. And so with that news having reached Jeroboam, he comes back. And he's, he's you know, very civil. He wants to talk to the new king, Rehoboam. And he's, he's simply asking, look, the northern tribes, the, these ten tribes, we, we ask that you ease up on the, the harsh taxes. You know, maybe something we can say, well, I understand <laughs> where they're coming from there. You know, ease up on the harsh taxes. All that your father Solomon had placed on us you know, is a heavy burden that is, is killing us. We can't handle all that you're throwing our way, you know, all of us up north, the northern ten tribes. But Rehoboam, he shows himself to be a very vain man. And in fact, threaten more taxes and a heavier burden. Even when, and this is where peer pressure comes in, on top of a already vain and prideful man. So Rehoboam first starts out wise. He's, let me go, you know, he says, Jeroboam, give me three days and we'll come back and discuss this more. And in that time, he goes and talks to his elders, these wise older individuals who have been a part of Solomon's kingdom as as he was king, to ask their advice. And they tell him, look, let's show our support. Let's, there's already tension between us and the ten northern tribes. You know, us and, and the tribe of Benjamin. It's, we're just kind of down here in almost a, an authoritarian way as Judah. So let's, let's respect what they're saying. Let's respect their wishes. You know, maybe not you know, take them all out, but let's reduce it. Let's look, look out for them. That's the wise words from these elders. Rehoboam being the vain man. Let me go talk to my buddies. So he goes talks to some of his friends closer to his age. And they're like, oh, no, you don't put up with that. You're now the king. You tell them that what Solomon did was a drop in the bucket to what you're going to do to them. Show them that you're the man. You're nobody to be messed with. And being the vain man he was... He did just that. Instead of taking the wise counsel, he went with the advice of his ignorant, hard-headed, stubborn friends. And that's when we get a, the famous words in 1 Kings 12, 14. He says, my father led, uh, laid on you a heavy yoke. I will make it even heavier. My father scourged you with whips. I will scourge you with scorpions. In other words, just that hyperbolic understanding that whatever my father did i'm going to just expand it even more i'm going to make life even harder than you can imagine because now i am in control i am the king but as you imagine this caused a great deal deal of turmoil many of the people say so we have no say in the house of david anymore so we have no rights as israelites as children of god are are we just simply under your dictatorship we're no longer following the, the understanding that we are a blessed nation, but now you're throwing down burdens upon burdens. And so we, we don't want any parts of this. You're no longer our king. It's not like the Americans where you say, not my president, and then just keep living your life. But no, these people said, you are not my king. We're going to find another to lead us, and we're going we're gonna to go our own way. You have no authority over us. And so that's when a rebellion took place and the 12 tribes of Israel split. And so if you hear reference throughout the Old Testament, this is the northern and southern split, the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom. And yes, Second Chronicles, the writer doesn't discuss other than this brief history. More often in you know, the book of First and Second Kings do you see this reference a little bit deeper but the book the the chronicler really doesn't reference the northern tribes at all more focused on the southern tribes and so this is when the split occurred the 10 northern tribes followed the leadership of jeroboam he is now their king and they forcefully said whatever it takes this is our king you are not our king we are our own people now we are going our own way and many Many reasons why the chronicler didn't, didn't focus on the northern kingdom is 
even more than the southern kingdom. They completely turn their back on pursuit of worship to God and understanding the temple of God, most because the temple is in the southern kingdom. And so everything was split, going their own way. Yes, a powerful people, but now under Jeroboam as a separate group of people. And now Rehoboam, he's left with his tribe of Judah and the tribe of Benjamin. You know, little tribes just in, you know, very significant in the entire kingdom, but now left just as the two of them as the other ten tribes go to follow the leadership of Jeroboam. He is the king of the north. Rehoboam is king in the south, king of Judah. And that's where we get most of our, our the predominant history narrative accounts in the book of Second Chronicles. And because of this split, even though it was his fault that civil war really broke out, even though it didn't at this point lead to battle, Rehoboam did try to take it that far. He gathered 180,000 young men to go in the battle against the north, against Jeroboam. But God stopped his efforts through she Shemaiah. And he tells them, this man of God tells Rehoboam that, look, the spirit, the spirit of God is at work here. This is God's doing. This split is what God has ordained. This is what God has done. And it's happened because it was a promise made to Solomon because of your father's sins. Because he broke a covenant with me that I made to him years ago to bless his people, to bless our nation, all of Israel, if they continued in obedience and devotion to me. But that was broken. And I told your father that the nation will be split because of those sins. So Rehoboam was wise in this case, listened, held back, and did not yet go to war. But now as king of Judah, Rehoboam made continually things worse and worse for the people of God because he continually abandoned the ways of God. You can see that in chapter 12 of 2 Chronicles because the covenant was broken. And so in the, the fifth year of his reign, you know, Shershak, king of Egypt, he's able to now capture the fortified cities in Judah and set out now against Jerusalem to conquer the capital, to conquer Jerusalem, the holy city. Shemaiah the prophet told Rehoboam, this is what the Lord says. You have abandoned me, therefore I now abandon you to Shishak. That's in chapter 12 as well. But thankfully, this was a wake-up call to Rehoboam. And it is what he needed as that you know, proverbial slap in the face, if you will. And that's when we see in verse 6, the leaders of Israel and the king humbled themselves and said, the Lord is just. In other words, yes, we, we brought this on ourselves. We deserve this. But now they're seeking you know, rescue from what they know is inevitable because of their own sins. Thankfully, with a, a you know, finally showing a sense of humility, God said that he would not destroy them at this time, but would allow them to become subjects to Shishak, who in just one generation, King Solomon made a magnificent temple, filled it with gold. Everything's wrapped in gold, precious um, stones everywhere. And now just his son, one generation later, allowed those treasures to be stripped away from the temple, stripped away from the temple of God, the things that were there to, in honor of the holiness and perfect nature of God are now being stripped away. Even you know some of the gold shields that Rehoboam was able to replace, but only in bronze, nowhere near the quality and the, the grandeur of his father Solomon and what he had done. And 2 Chronicles 12, 12 says, Because Rehoboam humbled himself, the Lord's anger turned from him, and he was not totally destroyed. And in fact, it says, indeed, there was some good in Judah. And really, if you think about some good in Judah, seems to be a fitting way to characterize the reign of Rehoboam. He was unwise, he was brash, and thus leading to the loss of his kingdom, the split of the, the ten northern kingdoms and the two southern. However, that loss was, again, God-ordained, was said this is what happens 
when the covenant is broken. And Rehoboam proceeded to follow the ways of the Lord for some time after this wake-up call, after finally seeing, no, this is becoming a reality. Not only is the nation split because of the sins of my father, but now because of my sins, Jerusalem is going to be ransacked, and the temple, all of our gold, all the precious stones, everything stripped out of the beautiful work that my father put in for Yahweh, for God Almighty and his temple. And so he, for a while, allowed that to be a wake-up call to repent and to pursue God. But then he turned from God, and the nation slid once again into moral and spiritual decay. And in this, and we'll see even more with other kings, we see the importance of wise leaders and the importance of maintaining faithfulness to God. Because when Rehoboam went his own way, things did not go well for his nation, for his kingdom. But when he listened to God, Judah was secure. Judah was protected by God as he promised he would. But as we see, I'll go through a quick recap of the kings through through Israel or through Judah's history and the ups and downs, the roller coaster of their pursuit of devotion to God and their backsliding away from God and what happened in each case. And that's when we see Abijah, who was the son who just simply continued the same error as his father, who again was not fully devoted to God. Abijah reigned for only three years in Judah before he died. And we see that you know, he's in Scripture known as a wicked king. That's how he goes down in history. 1 Kings 15 says he committed all the sins of his father had done before him. His heart was not fully devoted to the Lord his God as the heart of David's, his forefathers, had been. But because of the nature of Israel, fortunately, Asa, his son, succeeded him as king. And scripture says that he did right, or what was right, in the eyes of the Lord. We see his story in chapter 14. King Asa instituted reform. He removed the, the male shrine prostitutes, cut down the Asherah poles, and he even removed his grandmother from her position as queen mother because of her involvement with Asherah worship. She, he was getting rid of all of these false idols, false gods, and false worship and getting back to a nation of God devoted to God. And then Jehoshaphat, his son, succeeded him after death. And he, too, seeing what his father did, did what was right in the eyes of God. But because of the nation of Israel and its history, we see that when he died, Jehoram, his son, succeeded him as king. Second Chronicles 21, 4 tells us that when Jehoram established himself firmly over his father's kingdom, he put all his brothers to the sword along with some of the officials of Israel. Jehoram did evil in the eyes of God, in the eyes of Yahweh. So again, up and down throughout this history. Next was Ahiza, who only reigned one year and also did evil in the eyes of the Lord. Then came Joash, who restored finally Israel and the damage done to the temple. Joash was followed by, by Amiza, who did what was again right in the eyes of the Lord. But it says, but not wholeheartedly. You know, there was an attempt, but just a mediocre sense. You know, that's the legacy he leaves behind. How would you like that to be? He followed the Lord, but no, not wholeheartedly. I hope that's not on any of our gravestones when we leave this world, but it's devoted focus. But for Amiza, it was, yeah, he pursued the Lord, but not wholeheartedly. Uzziah, who came next, also did what was right in the eyes of the Lord, as did Jotham behind him. But as the trend has shown us, Ahaz became king, and he decided to go against God and now restored idol worship to Baal in the nation and amongst God's people. But thankfully, next was Hezekiah, who did what was right before God. Again, up and down throughout the, the history of Israel. But again, Manasseh became king, who once again turned from the Lord. It says he rebuilt the high places his father Hezekiah 
had demolished. He also protected altars to the bells and made Asherah poles. Behind him then was Ammon, who was no better. And between these two kings, they reigned over Israel for 57 years. So 57 years of turning their back on God, on pursuing idol worship, pursuing worship to Baal, pursuing worship to whatever you wanted to worship in the holy city of God. So that is where we see the ups and downs, turning their back and losing the blessings, restoring worship and seeing the blessings as a nation of God. And the new kings, by seeing the blessings, would take it for granted and then turn their back on the very one who was bringing the blessings in the first place. But thankfully, then we get to Josiah, who I wanted to spend a little bit more time on today. Josiah was a godly king and known as one of the world's youngest kings because he began his reign at only eight years old after his his father Ammon was assassinated. So I'm going to pick up in chapter 34. We basically just covered, you know, Almost all of Second Chronicles right there. You know, a, a lot missing between, but that's the, the history of the kings up to Josiah. It says, Josiah was eight years old when he began, began to reign, and he reigned 31 years in Jerusalem. And he did what was right in the eyes of the Lord and walked in the ways of David his father. And he did not turn aside to the right hand or to the left. For in the eighth year of his reign, while he was yet a boy, He began to seek the God of David, his father. And in the twelfth year, he began to purge Judah and Jerusalem of the high places, the shirim and the carved and metal images. Just in the 18th year, the early years, we already see him wanting to redirect Israel, to redirect Judah back to God, back to the God of his father, David, you know, great, great grandfather, many times back, you know, getting them back as the people of God. But in the 18th year of his reign, we see that he begins to raise money to repair the temple. All of the the previous idols, the previous stripping away of, of valuable items and jewels and gold, he's now working to repair that. And then during these repairs that the high priest, Hilkiah, found the book of the law. This is when we pick back up in verse 18 says, then Shaphan, the secretary, told the king, the king, Hilkiah, the priest, has given me a book. And Shaphan read it before the king. And when the king heard the words of the law, he tore his clothes. And the king commanded Hilkiah, Ahiakam, Ahi- the son of Shaphan, Abdon, the son of Micah, Shaphan, the secretary, and Asiah, the king's servant, saying, Go inquire of the Lord for me and for those who are left in Israel and in Judah, concerning the words of the book that has been found. For great is the wrath of the Lord that is poured out on us, because our fathers have not kept the word of the Lord to do according to what is written in this book. So we see in the process of rebuilding, getting back to a sense of the old temple, purging it of its idols, purging it of the filth, they find the book of the law. And this rediscovery of the law of the Lord is really one of the greatest highlights of Josiah's reign. That's when we see that revival truly taking shape. Even though it began just at eight years old and then at 16. And then later on in life as he's putting back work to you know, polish, to bring back beauty to the temple. Is when they find the laws of the Lord. And when they read it to Josiah The king tore his clothes because it was a sign of mourning and repentance. He saw that we have far from done what God has called us to do. We are far from the people of God, the children of God. The reason we've seen so much destruction and pain and division is because of our sin, our lack of obedience towards God. And Josiah saw that and repented and mourned for himself and for his people and for his fathers, grandfathers before him who had lived in opposition to this very law. But he he found it and now is wanting to restore the people of God. So he calls for a time of national repentance. And part of that repentance, as was for him, the law was read to the people of the land 
And then a covenant was made between the people and the Lord, saying, this is who we are. This is a covenant made by God to us through Moses. It's the law given to us, and we have not lived up to that. We call ourselves people of God, but according to this, we are far from that. Us as a nation have deserted God. We have completely abandoned him because we brought in other idols. We brought in other gods, all these false senses of worship and paganism. We have turned our back on God. No wonder we've seen the, the things happen to us. No wonder, or it's a wonder why we haven't seen worse because of the state of our focus and our heart towards God Almighty. So that's when going back to the book of 2 Kings, it says the king stood by the pillar and made a covenant before the Lord to walk after the Lord, to keep his commandments and his testimonies and his statutes with all his heart and with and all his soul to perform the words of his covenant that were written in this book. And all the people joined in the covenant. And then God told Josiah, because your heart was responsive and you humbled yourself before the Lord when you heard what I have spoken, I have also heard you, it declares Lord. He's, he's saying, because you've responded to my words, because you're receptive, you've humbled yourself, you've repented, I have heard you. I've heard your commitment. I've heard your true sense of repentance towards me as my people, as the people of God. And with that, we see many reforms followed in the nation of Judah and amongst God's people. We see again the temple was cleansed from the objects of pagan worship. The idolatrous high places in the land were demolished. Josiah restored the observance of the Passover and removed mediums and witches from the land. Anything in opposition to God that took away from worship to God that did not belong in the house of God, in the city of God, was stripped away and pushed aside and removed because that is not who we are as God's people. Second Kings 23 records, Before him there was no king like him who turned to the Lord with all his heart and with all his soul and with all his might, according to all the laws of Moses, nor did any like him arise after him. Josiah was a special king that now devoted himself and the nation of Judah back to God, restored them back to God with a nationwide revival. As I said with Solomon, the promise, the covenant was nationwide. And for that restoration to happen, then revival and repentance has to be nationwide as a people, not just a remnant, but the people of Judah coming back to God. Yes, unfortunately, we see that God's wrath would later come upon Judah you know, due to the evil king Manasseh, all that he had done. But the judgment was delayed because of Josiah's godly life and leadership. We see that wrath become a reality when Babylon took over Judah and destroyed Jerusalem. But that wasn't to happen at this moment. And so with his focus, his determination to turn to God, to focus on God, we truly can learn a lot from Josiah's life. First and simple terms, Josiah shows us the, the influence a person can have from a very young age. Even children have enormous potential to live for God and to have great impact. You know, Jesus refers to, you know, allowing the children to come to him, you know, the children coming and worshiping him and being just a pure sense of worship. Oftentimes, we as adults, you know, have a tendency to hinder them, to hold children back. But children can and will serve the Lord also. And they can have an enormous impact in the lives of their families and in the lives of their friends. I've seen where kids get on fire for church and the entire family come behind them because of that influence of that young child showing a love for God, a love for God's people, a love for God's church, and bringing the family as a whole back to God. Children can make a huge impact in the church. That's why children and the ministry with their kids is so vastly important and should be important. You know, so we learn that even young individuals, young Christians, young believers can have a huge impact 
for God and for the church. Second, Josiah showed us what it looks like to live a life fully committed and obedient to God. And because of that, he was blessed because of his commitment to God. We also see, thirdly, that Josiah properly responded to God's word. By the time he became king, the scriptures had long been neglected. And Josiah's heart was broken by the failure of his people to honor God's word, God's law. So Josiah had scripture read to the people and made a commitment to live by God's word. And in the book of 2 Chronicles, it highlights many of the reforms that were made, the changes that were made. But throughout the entire history you know, that we see in this portion of 2 Chronicles, it, it shows us the reforms that were changed by not just Josiah, but even the evil kings throughout Judah's history. Those who returned God's people to worshiping God and back to the temple and cleansing the temple. But then we see those who turn their back on God and what happened when they as kings neglected Israel's covenant and therefore Israel as a nation neglected that covenant. We see it's highlighted what comes with the blessings of obedience and the pulling away of blessings due to neglecting God, neglecting his word, something Josiah would not do, refuse to do. And so we see the writer, Ezra, or whomever it may have been, stresses the significance of their covenant with God and the ability of God to follow through on his promises. Again, this was a post-exile people, people who were sent away because of their sins, were sent off into exile to Babylon, now back to a fallen city, having to be reminded of that covenant and the ability of God to follow through on his promises of blessing if they are themselves obedient and devoted to him so you and i believers today you know church as a whole today needs to understand that while we are not israel we have the responsibility to pray and to long for the revival that we saw take place you know under josiah's ruler as king within the body of christ we we say we long for a sense of revitalization and renewal and revival and we are to pray for that but we have to understand that in order to see that we as individuals have to see the responsibility of living as representatives of that body understanding that if we are to be called his people his church the bride of christ then we need to pursue the holiness that comes with that title and only then can we even expect to see a sense of revival in our church and in our individual lives revival and renewal happen when we like josiah live fully committed and obedient lives for christ and when we begin to properly respond to and respect god's word god does he did and he still does bless his obediently devoted followers and he will give you know a a blessing not necessarily as a nation of america but individually as churches and as families there are blessings that come with devoted lives towards god it may not be all your answered prayers but there are blessings in a life focused on god and you and i we gain a clearer sense of this reality this truth when we begin to comprehend that the words we have in scripture are god breathed they are useful in our daily lives they are powerful they are perfect and that adds a sense of love for God's word, a respect for God's word. A love for God's word leads to a deeper love for the author. A deeper love for the author leads to a stronger commitment to our creator and savior. It redirects our focus by, like Josiah, understanding that God's word is significant, is holy, is powerful, is God breathed, inspired by our Creator for you and I, by gaining a sense and a clear picture of the power of God's Word, we gain a clear sense of our responsibility as the people of God. You see how the law of God changed Josiah's focus, changed Josiah's direction. It changed the direction of an entire nation because he saw it as it was, 
as the words of God, their creator, Yahweh, holy, powerful. This was for God's people to live like God's people. And if my people who are called by my name will repent, will pray, will seek, will obey, then we can, in fact, see the blessings that come with the life lived after, after those holy words. Josiah knew that. He saw the importance of that covenant. He saw the importance of true, devoted worship to God. And he saw the importance of living as the people of God. Saying, we call ourselves children of God, but let's look like it. Let's worship like it. Let's respect, honor, and glorify the name and the only name that deserves everything. Getting rid of all that hinders, getting rid of all the filth, and let's pursue a life focused on God. That's when change came. And if we as a church, even just Access Point, is ever going to see that revival, that renewal, that change, it starts with us beginning to respect God's word, understanding God's word for what it is. And now, by understanding the significance, begin to take God's word to heart, begin to see that there is power in that. And to allow our lives to be changed because of the power of God's word. That's when we begin to look and live like the people of God. Let's pray. Dear God, we love you. We thank you. Well, we thank you for this, the history in Judah. The, the history of their many kings. The ups and downs. The reminder that we as your people have responsibility to truly live in accordance to that name. We're easily calling ourselves Christians, but don't always look the part. Help us to understand your word for what it is, to respect it, to honor it. And by seeing that significance in your holy word, we take those words to a deeper meaning in our heart and allow it to change us, allow it to change who we are and what we do and how we treat others. And allow your word to lead to renewal in our lives. Help us to fall in love with your word. And to fall deeper in love with you as, our, as the author and as our creator. God, we thank you so much. And we love you, Lord. It's in your name we pray. Amen.